Goodbye! Hello, Heisman! 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 45. There goes Davis! Oh my God! Davis is going to run it all the way back! Auburn's going to win the football game! One more episode in the chaotic conference that is the Big 12. Hello, everybody. Welcome in the 3 Tech Pod, finishing up our Big 12 preview series along with Trey Reeves and Garrett Turney. I'm Mitch Mason. Glad to have you with us. If you are new to the channel or just discovering us for the first time through our preview series, we're delighted to have you. We'd love if you would subscribe, follow us on our channels at 3 Tech Pod, We're on the road to 1,000 followers and subscribers across all of those platforms. And uh, guys, this has been a really fun conference to break down. We knew it would. With Texas and Oklahoma jettisoning to the SEC, we have boiled the Big 12 into the teams in waiting. How far back is too far back? And now we've got... Uh, the the favorites to go to Jerry World, right? The, the championship contenders. And I think the first question I want to ask y'all before we break down these five teams, how many teams from the Big 12 get into the college football playoff? That is the golden question. And I think that's what's going to dictate. The Big 12 and the ACC are going to dictate a lot of how college football goes this year. And I think the fan reaction to the first college football playoff, because I think it's a max of two for one of those leagues and one for the other, personally. I, I think it's just a numbers game. Either the Big 12 or ACC will get two, and the other one will just get one. Yeah, I think you're probably right on that. I think the Big 12 does get the two, though. I think at the end of the season, I think you're going to have two Big 12 teams that kind of stand up above the rest. Somebody's got to win games in this conference, right? It's, it's you know We've talked about how there's like 10 teams that could end up finding their way to Arlington. But, like, out of those 10 teams, I think two of them is going to be able to get up to, like, 10 or 11 wins. Uh, and I think that, you know, you'll end up with a couple of very good teams in Arlington at the end of the season. And, you know, we're probably going to be talking about both of those two teams uh, today. So I, th- I think, you know, between those two, and kind of like what you're saying, Trey, one from the ACC, you get a G5 champion, and then, you know, you get kind of the eight remaining that will probably end up getting split by the the new mega conferences. I feel like two is probably the right answer, but we'll see. It's going to be fascinating. It's Honestly, it's going to depend on how September goes because the Big 12 plays a bunch of conference games early on, and then how November goes. I think that's going to really decide uh, if this is a two-team battle late, if there's just going to be one representative, whoever wins in Arlington, books their ticket to the playoff. Uh, but again, one of the just multiple fascinating storylines with a 12-team playoff on deck this season. And Trey, let's get into it here as our first team in the episode, the number five ranked Arizona Wildcats, as ranked by our listeners at home. Arizona is fascinating because they're not a traditional conference contender. They lost their head coach. They lost a good deal as far as numbers go in the roster, especially on the defensive side, they have a brand new head coach who is not uh, has not been a head coach at the Power Five or Power Four ranks, and yet a lot of people are picking Arizona to be a favorite to get to Arlington. I feel like I might be a little bit more reserved on them, but break down the Wildcats for us. Yeah, I think they have a really decent chance because they still have a lot of talent, especially on the offensive side of the ball. You mentioned. Completely new coaching staff. Brent Brennan comes over from San Jose State. I wasn't the biggest fan of the hire. I know he wasn't given a lot to work with at San Jose State, but under 500 career winning percentage. Completely new staff. I do like the offensive coordinator hire and Dino Babers, uh, the former Syracuse head coach. He has put a ton of really fun offenses on the field at Syracuse and Bowling Green and uh, even dating back to his time as a coordinator before that. He's had a ton of fun offenses, so I'm really interested to see what he can do with Noah Fafita and Tetraoa McMillan, who might be the best quarterback-receiver tandem 
in college football. That's a really, really fun tandem. They're, they're top five in my money. I, I don't know how you would rank that out. It, it's, you know, splitting hairs at that point, but definitely a top five tandem in the country. They have the majority of the offensive line back. They got a really nice running back pickup in the portal from New Mexico and Ja'Cory uh, Croxy Merritt. Uh, almost 1,200 yards and 17 touchdowns last year for the Lobos. So fun pickups in the portal. You did mention they lost a lot of talent on defense, especially on the defensive line. They're basically completely rebuilding the defensive line, and that's a big, big question mark for me. But they have enough on offense that I think they can compete. They've got they've got a lot of talent on that side of the ball, a lot of guys coming back. Their additions to the portal, bolstering the offensive line a little bit. I mentioned the running back pickup. The offense is going to carry the team, I think. And I think they're going to carry them to a lot of wins. With that offense, you know, they've replaced a good deal of production in, in the portal. Um, keeping Noah Fafita and, and T-Mac, Tetro McMillan in-house, I, I feel like is a win that mathematically it's hard to just assign that a win value, but you know it's huge, right? You know this is a far better setup that Brent Brennan is walking into than most. You almost want to count it as a portal addition, right? That you kept them out of the portal. Exactly. So yeah, it's like when you're grading, when you're using your rubric to grade, it's, it's almost like you get double points, right? Like you get the returning points, but you also, uh, it feels like get that added boost of winning them back, keeping them out of the portal when everybody thought they were gone. My question for Arizona is, at what point will we know their identity, whether it's as a front runner or as kind of that B level team this year? Like at what point do you look at their schedule and go, okay, I know what Arizona is this season and I'm confident in either buying or selling their stock. Well, it's really front loaded for me because they've got New Mexico and Northern Arizona. I think not a lot of people are penciling those in as losses. I think they should handle both of those games really easily. But after that, they've got a non-conference game at Kansas State. And then they go, they have a bye week and then they go to Utah. So they're going to get baptized by fire by the end of September. And we're going to know exactly where they stand by the end of September. If they can find a way to split those. Obviously, the Utah game for conference standing purposes would be a much bigger win because it would set them up at 1-0 in conference. But if they can just find a way to split those two monumental road games, I'm really buying in because I think, you know, if you can beat one of those two, I think you're feeling a lot better about the Texas Tech game at home Mm -hmm. and at BYU after that. After that uh, game at BYU, you've got Colorado, West Virginia at UCF, Houston at TCU, Arizona State. So it's certainly front loaded. There's some tricky spots down the back end, but find a way to win one of those first two. And you're really going to be starting to talk about the Wildcats as a real contender. I think if Arizona is going to pull off an upset over one of those two teams, I like it to be Utah, even though it's on the road, because you look at Utah's schedule, they have to play a road game at Utah State. I know Utah State's not going to be a very good team, but if it's a rivalry game, they're going to get up. They're going to want to squash little brother. Then they go to Oklahoma State for what could be a Big 12 championship showdown or preview rather with the Cowpokes in Stillwater. Then they come back home to take on Arizona. Meanwhile, Arizona gets a bye week off of that Kansas State game. Now, we know Kansas State is historically a little bit shaky early on, so maybe maybe we should be penciling that in as the upset special from the very beginning. But that schedule for Utah, the way that they would have to come home after two road trips, two highly emotional, likely physical games, and take on the Wildcats, that's got my... That's got my spidey senses tingling just a little bit, right? Even though it's on the yeah. road, it feels like there's enough advantage maybe going towards Arizona where you catch Utah on a bad game, uh, you know, coming down off of it, you know, a high or, or maybe stumbling after a loss in Stillwater. Suddenly Utah looks a little, a little bit mortal. Yeah. And Arizona coming off a buy in that one, like you mentioned, that's, that's a perfect storm setup. If it was in Tucson, I'd feel a lot better about picking the Wildcats in that one, but yeah, just find a way to win one of those two if you're Arizona and your your stock's through the roof. So look down the rest of that schedule. It's after You mentioned the Texas Tech game following Utah. Then it's at BYU, Colorado, West Virginia, at UCF, a bye week, 
Houston at TCU, and Arizona State. Are there any landmines the rest of the way on this schedule that have you worried? Because you get West Virginia at home. You get uh, Houston at home off of that bye week. Really, the toughest road trip I think that they face the rest of that way is to UCF. Yeah, TCU could be really difficult at the end of that schedule as well. But yeah, I mean, the majority of the tough games after the Utah game are at home. And you've yeah. got to love that how that sets up if you're Arizona for a stretch run. Remember, this is a team last year that started 3-3 three and three before they won seven straight to close out the season, including the bowl game. So they, they are a team that uh, culturally knows how to close strong. I know that was a different coaching staff, but culturally they know how to close strong, and that might be the case again this year. They're over-unders at seven and a half. This really, even if you're out on them as a Big 12 championship contender, getting the eight wins against this schedule, it feels fairly solid to go ahead and take that over. The betting public slightly favoring that. Yeah, I'm taking the over for Arizona. I think they're right on that 8-9 line with a potential, again, if they can upset one of those two teams at the beginning to get to 10. And mm -hmm. who knows how the tiebreakers are going to shake out in this conference, honestly, oh, if they can get to wait. 10 wins. Yeah, cannot wait. The offense should be as explosive as anybody in the country. If the defense can step up, get some continuity early, look out. The Arizona Wildcats are, are going to be a team to watch. Number four in our poll is the Kansas Jayhawks. And I can assure you, this is the highest that the Jayhawks have appeared in any poll in quite some time. Uh, Kansas went nine and four last season, five and four in conference play, but uh, they didn't have a healthy quarterback room. It was Jason Bean coming off the bench in for the majority of the season, really, and kind of guiding uh, an injured Jayhawks team to nine wins. They won the guaranteed rate bowl, something that they hadn't done uh, since uh, I believe 2007 was their last bowl win. So Garrett, Kansas is one of your pet cats. They're a lot of fun offensively, seemingly have certainly taken some strides defensively, although they lost some pass rushers from that roster. What can we realistically expect from the Jayhawks in 2024? Well, realistically, I think you can expect a very good, very competitive team because that's just what Lance Leipold has right now. I, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that this team has high end potential. And, and I think, you know, kind of analyzing this team going into this, I think that there's a good chance to be made that you could be arguing Kansas could be one of the better teams in the whole country at the end of the season. If everything comes together. Now let's talk about what I mean by that. So I, I went back to last year's games just to kind of see what was on the game log and kind of see like, Hey, what were the results? Right. Um, they got smoked by Texas and Austin. But then their losses were by seven points, three points, and four points after that. So a lot of one-score games that, you know, you just have a healthy quarterback for that or, or you know, even not just healthy, but, you know, playing in rhythm with all of his other teammates. You might make an argument that they could flip all those one-score games and you're talking about a one-loss Kansas team last year. Now, that sounds crazy. One-loss Kansas, what are we talking about, right? But let's kind of talk about, what they're bringing back this year. And I think that this is kind of the big deal. So they lose some guys up front on the defensive side of the ball, which obviously is going to be an issue. They got to find ways to replace them, but they bring back probably two of the better corners in their entire conference. This is Kobe Bryant and Melo Dodson. We're talking about Kobe and Melo again. And uh, this is kind of fun because yeah, they got like baller mentalities back there. Both those guys had a bunch of picks last year. And then, you know, I think Melo scored two touchdowns. So, you know, we're talking about talented baller corners that they can rely on and, and a lot of experience back there on the offensive side of the football they're bringing back like everything they're bringing back all their top end guys that caught passes they're bringing back both of their stud running backs Devin Neal uh Daniel Hyshaw and, and those two guys combined for almost 2,000 yards on the ground last year um and so we're talking about some serious talent and yeah they get their kind of all you know all conference, all American quarterback, possibly. We, we could be talking about him at the end of the year with this and Jalen Danis. He's a very good quarterback. He makes crazy plays. He's plenty athletic. He, he can do what he needs to do. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy, right? And so when you talk about Kansas this year, it has to start and stop with Jalen Daniels making it through 12 games, right? If he can't make it through 12 games, Kansas ain't going to have a good season. You lose being – that sucks, but, you know, it is what it is, right? You lose your backup – he served admirably. He wasn't supposed to be your guy in the first place. You have to have Daniels healthy. Now, regardless of if he's healthy or not, they're going to run the football. 
and they're going to be able to complete passes. But here's the thing I think is a little bit overlooked. I'm looking up and down their, you know, starting. I, I look at basically everybody on their starting on the offense and the defense. They do not start a freshman or a sophomore anywhere on their team. And that's a big deal. Being able to bring back only juniors and seniors into your starting you know, lineups, it, it's a big deal to be able to have that kind of experience, that kind of we've been in the program, that kind of we've been in the weight room. Like There's a big difference between 18 and 19-year-old kids and then these 20, 21, 22-year-old kids that have been in the weight room a couple more years and have been able to develop the, the their bodies. And so, you know, I, I think Kansas, man, like we're looking at, an incredible, I, I think, offensive team. I was looking back at some of their scoring rankings, going back to Lance Leipold, go back to 21. Uh, they were 111th, and then they were 21st, and then they were 17th last year. So meteoric rise in the scoring. The defense took a big step forward last year as well, going from, uh, what is it, 124th to 67th. And so, look, the numbers are going the right direction. If Jalen Daniels stays healthy – if he can mesh well with the new offensive coordinator, Jeff Grimes, like if he can mesh well with all that, if the system makes sense, and there's plenty of reasons to think that it will, this is a Kansas team I think a lot of people need to be on serious upset watch against because they could end up running this conference by the time we get to uh, the end of the season. I think that like the more complete version of Texas Tech, right, where health is the key ingredient, you've got an explosive offense, uh, and in this case, you've got veterans on defense. Texas Tech mm -hmm. is going to be replacing a lot of guys on defense. But for me, the most interesting nugget in all of this is that Kansas doesn't have a true home game, right? They don't yeah. play on <laughs> campus. They're splitting it between Children's Mercy Park, which I believe is the FCS stadium, correct me if I'm wrong, and then Arrowhead Stadium. Obviously, I thought that was, was that Sporting Kansas City? I think it's the soccer team. They're playing like they're not FCS. I'm sorry. That's what I meant to say. Was yeah. I was like, I think yeah. They're playing a couple of the soccer teams, and then they're playing a bunch at Arrowhead. Which like, look, I, we talked about this a little bit in the off season, but I think that could go Kansas's way because they'll kind of get used to that environment. But you see games that go into NFL stadiums get weird sometimes, where it's like, oh, we're playing in an NFL stadium. This is crazy. Ah, ha, 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 ha. And it kind of gets to be a big moment, distracts from the game. I think it could go Kansas's way after, you know, the first one or two of those games there. So I, I don't know. I just, I, I think Kansas is set up for a great season. I, you know, I, there's a lot of reasons to like the Jayhawks this year. Mitch, we pay you to know college football, not uh, major league soccer <laughs> acronyms. It, yeah. I, I, I was in my mind, I was trying to say FC Kansas city, knowing that wasn't going to be right. And it came out <laughs> FCS. So, you know, that's um, all good. Uh, you, you clearly know which one of us is. You know all the college fan. football things. We appreciate you. That, that's right. Uh, their over under guys is at eight and a half, which feels exorbitantly high for Kansas <laughs> given their recent. Yeah, I was going to say, can we just pause for a second and appreciate that Kansas has an over under of eight and a half in the preseason? And like, we've gotten to an awesome existence, and everything else that's happened in college football. You can say, oh, I don't like realignment. I don't like this. But we can all kind of rally around everybody else and say, hey, look at Kansas. Good for those guys. Eight and a half is their over. And I, I like this existence. I like this reality that we live in in college football. Well, and this is a schedule from the football gods because they avoid Arizona. They avoid Utah. They avoid Oklahoma State. Basically, all the other favorites to win the conference are not on the Jayhawks schedule. Of course, they have... Uh, the Kansas State game, October 26th, that is a road game. They haven't won at Bill Snyder Family Stadium in forever. Uh, been been decades, I believe, since they've won there. But other than that, this, this schedule is built to succeed. They will have a physical test at Illinois Week 2. They'll have a very interesting home game against UNLV in the go-go offense. You, you want to get a test early of what that secondary is going to be able to do? UNLV is going to come marching into town with yep. two potentially starting quarterbacks, right, for that <laughs> game. Uh, but this also feels relatively front-loaded. They go to West Virginia as well. They play TCU. Um, not saying that Houston's going to be a pushover, but we certainly expect them to be less than in year one. Uh, and then they close with at BYU, Colorado, and, and at Baylor, Iowa State's off that bye week. Um, so they've got some landmines sprinkled in here. But guys, it could have been so much tougher. They really don't have incredibly difficult back-to-backs with conference contenders at all this season. Yeah, and that's really why 
you know, for me, I think this is an over bet for Kansas, you know, and I'm willing to lock that in pretty early because I just don't see a lot of opportunities for them to mess up, right? Like, I think their hardest game of the season is at Kansas State because, you know, yeah, they got a, a freshman quarterback, and we'll talk about them in a second, obviously. There's a lot of hype, but he, you know, still, you know, young kid or, you know, sophomore coming into it. Red, I don't know if he redshirted last year. I don't know how many games he played, but, you know, the young kid and, you know, at a certain point, you know, I, I like the experience for Kansas in that one, so I don't think they really get blown out of the water in that game. It'll be a good one. It'll be a close one, probably, but Really, where else in the schedule do you say, like, oh, there's, like, a big chance at a slip-up? Like, at West Virginia maybe could be an issue. Um, you know, may maybe we're talking about, you know, Iowa State at Arrowhead as a possibility. Uh, maybe Colorado exceeds expectations and they could, you know, drop to Colorado at Arrowhead. But I, I just – I'm not really too worried about this Kansas schedule. I love the – I think that's the big deal is I love the experience coming back. Eat Let's go on the worst case scenario for Kansas and say that, you know, Jalen Daniels does get hurt again. Yes, you're going to be breaking in a new quarterback, but you've got every single piece around him bringing back so much experience to kind of help that guy get up to speed. Right. So, you know, if you can turn around and hand this thing, Devin Neal, Daniel Hyshaw, like you're feeling pretty good about your situation, you know, being able to pick up the offense and hand it off to big time players. And, and yeah, there's just a lot of experience on the defense. This, this is a good Kansas team. And, and I think, I mean, I think that if things swing the right way, if they can get this thing rolling and then again stay healthy, we could be talking about a, a you know Kansas team in Arlington with you know one maybe no losses at the end of the season, and and I'm personally rooting for that because I think playoff Kansas is that other part of the reality that I want to live in at the end of this season. Is Kansas locking up one of those by bi week games, right, or something like that, where they're a conference champ at the end of the season, they get a top four spot. That's the reality I want to live in this season. Shades of 2007, I'll tell you what. Health <laughs> health is key. Health is key. But the Jayhawks could really treat us to a fun October, November finish to the season as well. Let's go across the state to Little Manhattan, uh, or Manhattan, the Little Apple. Kansas State is also a conference front runner, And Trey, this is a team that has handed the keys to a young quarterback. You made the Baylor comparison when we previewed the Baylor Bears, Avery Johnson has been uh, anointed the new prince of the kingdom. Will Howard was shipped out to Ohio State. But Kansas State is a team that certainly has their eyes on Arlington. They have their eyes on a conference championship. And now they don't have Texas or Oklahoma to stand in their way. Yeah, and obviously Kansas State won the conference two years ago, defeated TCU in that dramatic championship game. Won nine games last year, including the bowl game. All four of their losses, guys, were by less than eight points. Mine, just mind-numbingly frustrating season in Manhattan last year. And you're right, they're handing the keys over to Avery Johnson. It's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out because – I don't like making the Baylor comparison, but it is right there. It's very low hanging fruit. You have a successful big 12 championship winning quarterback and you hand the keys off, run them out of town. I, I know that that's not the full story. Kansas state fans. I know that Avery Johnson is a five-star and probably the most talented on paper quarterback you've ever had, but the comparison is very easy and lazy for me. So I just like to throw it out there. Um, I don't think it's going to turn out how it turned out down in Waco. I think Avery Johnson is more than capable but you do have to recognize that it is a risk to hand the keys over like that. And I'm really more concerned, guys, not so much about Avery Johnson, but more about the turnover around Avery Johnson. They lost four out of the five offensive linemen, lost their offensive coordinator, Colin Klein, to AM, and they're replacing him with Matt Wells and uh, the offensive co line coach, Connor Riley, is getting promoted to be co-offensive coordinators. I'll be honest, I'm not sure who's calling the plays in that situation or what that situation is, but I do know that Colin Klein is a fantastic offensive mind, and that's certainly going to be something that they have to overcome losing him. So there, there's a lot of interesting additions. Like they they got Easton Kitty out of uh Kitley out of North Dakota to come in and kind of bolster the offensive line. They had some experienced guys that have gotten playing time in the two deep that are going to now step up to full-time starting roles too. So we just got to see how quickly that offensive line can gel. Dante Cephas, you guys remember him? The guy yes. that was at, just lit the world on fire at Kent State and then tried to do that at Penn State and it just didn't happen for him. 
he's now at Kansas state. So I'm really fascinated to see if a change of scenery, if he can do it in a power conference, Dylan Edwards, the running back from Colorado is going to be the second string running back in this offense behind DJ Giddens. So there's a lot of skill position talent around Avery Johnson, helping be successful offensively. I'm only worried about how quickly the offensive line can gel. Got to figure that out. Got to make sure the play calling doesn't take too much of a step back as well from what Colin Klein was doing. I think we're going to be okay. And on the defensive side of the ball, they lost two of their better uh, defensive backs. Kobe Savage and Will Lee transferred out to Oregon and A&M respectively. But uh, Jordan Riley Scott from Ball State is a really nice playmaker that they brought in through the portal. So how fast can the offensive line gel? How fast can the secondary gel? in uh in the back end of the defense that's going to to me just determine how quickly they can hit the ground running this year they might have a little bit of a cushion to to understand what that secondary is going to look like in game reps because you've got ut martin you got a road trip to to lane which you lost this game last year at home so by no means an off week uh to lanes you know going undergoing their own changes as well at the quarterback position as well as coaching staff. Um, but I tell you what, the, the Green Wave are a playoff contender and a playoff front runner in the American, in the group of five as well. So certainly not a bye week in week two. Then you get Arizona at home. You better be ready for that one. <laughs> you better be ready for T-Mac and Noah to come in there. Exactly. You get Arizona, uh, potentially an off week at BYU, although playing at altitude is always weird. And then Oklahoma State. I feel like in these first five weeks, we're going to know everything we need to know about Kansas State. I just hope Avery Johnson can get punched in the mouth and jump back up. Because do you expect Kansas State to go undefeated through this stretch? That is a fantastic question. I, I think they're notoriously start slow. You mentioned the Tulane loss last year. If you want to talk about the Tulane game this year, I think we've mentioned it a couple times on this show. Tulane brings back two of the highest graded interior pass rushers Mm -hmm. in all of college football, according to pro football focus this year. And so that week two uh, married with a Kansas state offensive line, that's going to be trying to figure out how to gel going to be fascinating to see how that turns out. So it's really difficult. I love that they get both Arizona and Oklahoma state at home. If one of those was on the road, I'd say no, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they end September undefeated because both of those two big games, Arizona and Oklahoma state are at home and Oklahoma state. We'll talk about them in a second. Garrett, I'm sure will correct me. I'm not as worried about Kansas state. Obviously Ollie Gordon is all everything. And that's a different level of running attack. But if Oklahoma State had a dominant passing attack to pair with that, I'd be more concerned about that game for Kansas State. It's going to be a great game. I, I would love to be at that game because I think it's going to be a fun back and forth one. But I, th- I lean Kansas State in that one right now at home. Okay, so follow-up question. They're nine and a half. Uh, their over-under is nine and a half. If you've got them going undefeated through what is certainly the most difficult part of their schedule – What's the ceiling for Kansas State? This absolute ceiling is undefeated and 12 and 0 and go into the college, uh, at least to the Big 12 championship, because I think Utah would be a really bad matchup for them. I think Oklahoma State and Arizona are very interesting matchups for them. Sure. Uh, so I, I don't think they will go 12 and 0. And there's a lot of other places they could trip up. They go to West Virginia, they go to Colorado right? Kansas uh, in a game that Kansas would love to win because they haven't beaten their rivals in a long time. There's a lot of spots to trip up. I was at Iowa state, a team that beat them last year um, in Manhattan. So there's a lot of spaces to trip up, but if everything clicks and that's a big if, because I think the national perception of Kansas state is it's just going to be an easy transition. They've got an upgrade at quarterback coming and all that. They lost more than the national perception is giving them credit for. So I don't think it's going to be as easy of a transition as something. If everything clicks, they could go 12 and 0, but that's a big if, if everything clicks quickly on time, they overcome some adversity early and they grind out some wins early. Maybe while it's not completely working, then they could go 12 and 0, but I'd put that. I don't think any team in the big 12, 12 and 0. I, I think that predicting a team 
in this conference with how just how much parity there is and how close everyone is in relative talent level, predicting a team to go 12 and 0 is, I just don't think you're going to find it. No, I think this is going to be a cluster of 11 and 1, 10 and 2, tight and 3. Team. It would nine not surprise three. me if the champions 9 and 3 and getting a top four seed in the playoff. Oh, just peak Big 12 vibes. I, I absolutely appreciate it. Kansas State, I think, is certainly one of my favorites to make it to the Big 12 championship game. They could very easily have a rematch with number two on our list, which is Oklahoma State. Garrett, the Pokes bring everybody back. Their returning production is scary. It's much like Iowa State, who leads the country in that metric. Uh, Oklahoma State has all their starters back. That is a positive on most accounts. But what Trey alluded to might be a negative because you've got the well-traveled Alan Bowman who returns at starting quarterback for the Pokes, uh, I believe is in his seventh year. He's never really established himself as an upper echelon quarterback. Looked like he was going to in 2018 when he was a freshman uh, at Texas Tech. Injuries kept him off the field. He goes to Michigan, doesn't even get to play. Back down at Oklahoma State where he did just enough to pilot them to a Big 12 championship game before getting run ruled by Texas last season. But another year... Ollie Gordon will be the featured back from the very get-go. Oklahoma State certainly belongs in this conversation for the best team in the conference. They belong here, and it's partially because we typically don't know what to expect from Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State's one of those teams that, you know, if Gundy has them, you know, in the right mood with the right feeling, it, it just feels like Oklahoma State's, un, like, unstoppable and then the second that like the wrong headline hits the locker room and everybody starts thinking about it too much, they implode. And, and you know, to kind of go through some of this, uh, you know, last season they lose to South Alabama, uh, but they do upset Oklahoma on their way out the door and end up making it to their conference championship game. So yep. who knows what to expect with the Cowpokes? The one thing you can expect is that this team is, like you said, Mitch, they're bringing back almost everyone from last year, so just copy-paste what last year's team was to this, and you can kind of see what they're going to try to do. They're going to run the football with Ollie Gordon. They figured that one out a couple games too late, probably. Unfortunately, I was looking back through some of his game logs. He didn't have 10 carries until, like, three or four weeks into the season, four, and then it's when he really took off and was, like, 18 carries, 29 carries, 33 carries. Like, it was just insane how much they're giving him the football he's you know rushing for almost 300 yards i think against west virginia and so it, it he took off again tease up go ollie we love it you know like a, a you know stereotypical you know georgia type running back i'm gonna let that joke sit there for just a little bit longer but just the kind of guy you'd expect georgia uh to to put on the field and and you know does stuff off the field similar but you know, we'll see how long he ends up having to sit out. But but Alan Bowman, he's back, which is good, right? Lots of experience there. Hasn't died of natural causes yet. And so, you know, he's he's going to be the quarterback again this year. He's throwing to Brandon Presley, Rashad uh, Owens. Plenty of talent all across the field. And, 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 you know, Alan Bowman, I think, unfortunately, and a lot of my Oklahoma State, you know, friends and family that, that watch them a lot closer than I do, they'd probably agree with this sentiment that, Alan Bowman's comp is probably Bo Wallace, where it's just he sometimes he's good Bowman and sometimes he's bad Bowman, right? It, it, you just get a good quarterback sometimes, and then sometimes he'll just really cost you the game. Um, it, you <laughs> look at the Texas, you know, game in the Big Twelve Championship. He he borderline cost him the game, just throwing up so many picks. So, like again, th this is a team that I think you can expect to play well in most of their games. But truly, it's just going to be what version of the Cowboys show up. Are they going to show up with good quarterback play, disciplined quarterback play, and you're going to hand it to Ollie 20, 25 times a game, and you're just going to do your thing like that, right? Hit some shots over the top, keep the defense honest. Or are you going to throw some picks? Are you going to get away from your game plan? Are you going to, you know, turn around and not do the right thing? This is, you know, kind of what ended up happening last season when, you know, they end up losing to UCF right after that big win. They lose to UCF, and I think Ollie had like maybe 10, 12 carries the entire game, didn't run for a whole bunch because they just got away from their game script. They didn't play their style of football. You get smoked on the road sometimes, that's fine. You just have to commit to playing your game. And so if Oklahoma State can play their brand of football, they can make it back to Arlington, no question. 
but that's a big if you know, not getting pushed off of what they're wanting to do, letting the quarterback, you know, kind of play his game, be consistent and, and you know, watching some of those playmakers step up around Ollie Gordon. This can't be a one man show. Uh, it kind of was last season. It won't be this season. People are going to load the box against Oklahoma State and say, go ahead, beat us through the air. They're going to have to. They have the pieces. It's just a question if they can actually do that and then get that done. It, I, there's every reason to believe in this team. And yet, if you just look back at some of their results the last you know, 10, 15 years, there's every reason to not believe in this team as well. I'm going to believe in this team. I think if the defense – certainly took lumps at times last year. Yeah. If they can take a step forward this year, uh, defensively, Brian Nardo is taking over as the defensive coordinator. He comes from Division II Gannon, uh, and he brings with him one of the best players at the Division II level, and Obi Egbo, who had seven, or I'm sorry, 14 career sacks. He is a true quarterback hunter. Then elsewhere, you've got nine starters that return on the defensive side. Kendall Daniels, Nick Martin, Cameron Epps, Trey Rucker, all household names there in Stillwater. You just need Oklahoma State's defense to raise their mm -hmm. production just a little bit. I think this offense is going to be good enough to score 30 plus points a game. And in the Big 12, where they have corrected that narrative that nobody plays defense, I think you've started to see the defense yep. improve year over year. I still think Oklahoma State, with all that production, in a year where everything has changed, and we talk about the transfer portal and guys, you know, freshmen having to start, so many unknowns. Oklahoma State is the known quantity uh, in in uh, in the conference this year, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that has to count for something, and I think it's for that main reason I'm thinking the Cowboys end up in Arlington again this year. Yeah, Trey, you sent a note in our chat. Nardo was there last year, um, so this is his second year. Uh, but uh, still, defense took its lumps last year. I think you're going to see some improvement in 2023. Well, and if you want some reason for optimism on the offensive side and being able to make this offense a little bit more explosive in the pass game, Alan Bowman kind of bounced around a little bit. And so maybe some of the inconsistency is just the fact that he wasn't able to really settle in and be comfortable as a starter. You know, maybe at this point, you know, you've been through, you know, full season and, a, you know, there were some ups and downs for sure. And you got a you know, heck of a running back to hand it off to. So maybe at this point he can say, OK, I can kind of release, let it fly a little bit, you know, maybe check in and out of a run play every here and there. And then, you know, kind of identify what the defense is giving him. And, and you know, maybe with that little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra comfort being there in still water, he can take that to the next level. I, I think he's plenty talented enough to do it. And it certainly helps when you got a guy like Presley out there to go, you know, hawk a ball down. So that's, that's kind of nice. But um, yeah, I just, I think the big thing for them is going to be that beginning of the schedule, back half of the schedule, super manageable. Uh, but that first part, you, you have your out of conference stuff, but then you get a Utah, Kansas state, West Virginia, back to back to back right before that bye week that's tricky. That's, you know, if you can go undefeated through that, you're probably feeling real good about your season. Even one loss probably doesn't kill you, but you know, you drop a couple of those games and you could be looking at, you know, kind of being outside looking in for the rest of the season. Certainly uh, helpful that Oklahoma is not on the schedule this year. Although Certainly. like I made the joke with TCU losing a win off their schedule with Texas, maybe Oklahoma state lost a win off their schedule with, yep. uh, with the Sooners. Top team in the Big 12, as voted on by you, the listener, is the newcomer, the Utah Utes. We've got offensive additions in uh, in the form of little-known little, little known quarterback Cameron Rising, tight end Brenton Keithy. Uh, those are massive additions. Both of them missed last season, the entirety of last season, with injuries. We kept waiting. When are we going to have a Cam Rising sighting? It never came. Utah decided, you know what? Let's put you on the bench. Let's let you get healthy, and he's coming back for one more year. And I think because of the veteran presence of Rising, you've got a lot of people projecting Utah to be the top team in the conference. Their defense might not be the same Utah defense that we're used to. They've lost a lot of contributors over these last couple seasons to the draft. But as we kind of roundtable the Utes here to finish up, where do you guys have Utah projected in this Big 12? Are they open shut case to Arlington or are there places for them to struggle this season? 
I, I mean, like I said, uh, when we were talking about Kansas State, I don't think any team is going to go undefeated in the Big 12 this year, but there's certainly, I have put my hard-earned American currency on them making the playoff. So not a huge <laughs> bet, but I, I have put my money but where my mouth is with Utah. It is there. And I, I expect them to be in the college football playoff, not financial advice, I, as we always say, but um, yeah, I'm expecting Utah to be in the playoff. They're the favorite to me at this point. Yeah, I I think it's pretty open and shut. I do think they probably run the tables here in the first year. Hardest part is going to be there at the end of September at Oklahoma State, followed by Arizona. But if they can kind of weather that a little bit, I, I don't think they really have any issues. And and I think that the experience helps, right? I did make the joke about, you know, Alan Bowman not dying of natural causes. So that does apply here with Cam Rising. You know, he's <laughs> been in college football for, I mean, gosh, I you know. It's been so long at this point that he's been in college football and he's kind of the joke old man at this point. But there is something to having that level of experience. And the offense was really good when he was there. I mean, don't forget, Cam Rising won his conference two years in a row. Uh, and so, you know, he's he's beaten good teams along the way doing it, including a, a very good uh, USC team, and a very good USC offense um, a couple years ago. So, I, I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, this is a good Utah team. This Utah team bringing back some talent that, you know, they, they lost for injury last year. And kind of to your point with the defense, you just said, like, yeah, they're losing some pieces. When does Utah not play good defense? Like, I can't remember the last year that Utah just played, like, really bad defense, couldn't tackle, weren't physical, didn't get in their gaps. Like, I can't remember a time that that's happened. And so I, I do think they just have kind of a good scheme there, um, good culture up there. They always play hard. You know, those home games are going to be especially tough for teams that had to go up to the mountain to go play them. So I, I really like what Utah's got. Schedule's, again, really, really easy and manageable, I think, after September. So, you know, I think you're hoping if you're Utah to get out undefeated. Uh, and then once you get to October, it's just time to tune things up, get ready, you know, to go make a run at Arlington and, and then the playoff afterwards. And I think I think the focus for Utah defensively for me is in that secondary, right? They lose a couple of safeties to the NFL. The front seven is largely intact. They're going to be replacing a couple of pieces. But uh, the schedule, certainly, it, it's tougher up front. Uh, I think figuring out what exactly Baylor is in week two will be maybe more difficult than originally meets the eye. And then, of course, you've got Oklahoma State and Arizona that we talked about before the first bye week. After that, I mean, you know, Trey, they get TCU at home. They go to Arizona State and Houston again. I don't think we're particularly scared of those two teams. Uh, they do go to Colorado late in the season. Maybe that's a Colorado team that's surging. Maybe that's a Colorado team that's beaten down and has quit. Uh, I don't know quite yet what the read on the buffs is going to be. They get Iowa State at home, but then kind of a tricky Week 12 matchup. At UCF, UCF may not have a ranking next to their name right now, and they're not a conference favorite, but man, we did say they were not too far back in our conference power ranking to suggest that they could make a run to Arlington. A special UCF team hosting Utah to finish out this first year of the expanded Big 12 and the expanded playoff era, that feels like the script that college football writers would die for. Yeah, that could be a really, really fun game. I, It's hard to find losses on this Utah schedule. It, it is really hard. You got to stretch. You got to really squint to see the ones. If they can get by Oklahoma State in Stillwater mm. and the Arizona game back-to-back, -back, like that's obviously the toughest back-to-back -back, like you guys have mentioned. The back half is, is looking really smooth. Iowa State at home won't be easy either. I think Iowa State has a game that will travel – even to altitude and even up to Salt Lake City. But I, I, it's hard to find losses on the back half of that schedule. One other guy that I don't think you guys mentioned, I might have missed it, Dorian Singer, the former USC and Arizona yep. wide receiver. Yeah. Did you guys talk about him already? No, we didn't. Right okay, so I'll, I'll bring him up. Um, <laughs> so I, I Yeah, I'd get distracted sometimes. But 1,100 <laughs> yards as a sophomore at Arizona two years ago, just couldn't really get it going at USC last year. Might be the most talented wide receiver Cam Rising has ever had. It's it's very fair. There are a lot of them, just to be fair. But I mean, I have to go back through the list for the last like you know twelve years when Cam Rising's been at Utah. 
That's well, fair, but it's usually been the tight end that, that's yes, been the big yep. weapon in that offense. And now you're telling me you have a guy that's done it before in a power conference out wide to add to that. Like that, that's scary for big 12 defenses. Yep. Uh, and he's poised potentially for a breakout season. Folks forgot about him when he went to USC, just wasn't really all that involved. Wasn't that impactful um, up there for the Trojans. So a, a new lease on life here for Utah. The Utes are going to be fun. Uh, all in all, I think this is going to be maybe maybe the most pure fun conference in the country for for those of us that don't have a dog in the fight, right? Like we just get to sit back and enjoy. I think the Big Twelve is going to cannibalize itself. I think this is going to be just a treat to watch. Uh, and I, you know, they're inevitably if there was one conference where I think the landmines are just going to be blowing up left and right, it really could be the Big Twelve because you know we we talk about teams like Houston and Baylor. We previewed them in that first episode. It's not that their rosters aren't talented. It's just we don't project them to put it all together consistently, right? But that doesn't mean that in a random week eight game, even on the road, they can't come up and get you. They've got explosive playmakers. I think the Big 12 has raised its floor, I think might be fair to say, um, with Houston and with UCF. Cincinnati, eventually, I think they're on that right track. But I'm, I'm really excited to watch football this fall, and the Big 12 is certainly towards the top. Well, and you can almost guarantee there's going to be at least one, maybe two, just like what the heck happened there games, right? Where it's, yeah. it's you know, I, I could see, you know, Oklahoma let's just State at Utah UCF for, last year. Well, I mean, yeah. but like even just look at this schedule, like, okay, let's say that Utah is cruising and then they have to go to Houston and it's just, you know, Utah in Houston for us. And just think about the visual of, the Utes getting off the bus and they're going to play Houston now. And then, you know, they go in there and they lose a game against Houston just cause, right? Like we'll be sitting there like, what happened? They're like, I had sacked Cam Rising six times. I don't know what to tell you. It just, it just happened. Right. And so like, there's going to be at least one of those types of games on the schedule this year in the big 12, probably a couple of those where it's just that team had no business winning that game, but they went in and did it. Get ready. Get your popcorn ready. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Big 12 hopefully is as unhinged as we think it will be. And of course, if you're a college football fan, if you're ready to partake, follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, YouTube as well, at 3 Tech Pod. We'd love to have you along for the ride. Three down, one to go in the power ranks. We've got the ACC up next. We'll have our Notre Dame previews, our full group of five previews coming for you as well. We'll get into all the storylines uh, from the Pack two uh, to which group of five team is our favorite to make the playoff as well. For Trey Reeves and Garrett Turney, I'm Mitch Mason. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Until next time, so long, everybody. Gracious, how about that?